okay, now I'm now I'm torn. I just like fast. <laughs> if it's fast, I'll watch it. I can even watch table tennis. Like it just has to like keep going. It just has to keep going. That's funny. Table tennis in the Olympics is unbelievable, right? Yeah, it's crazy. All right. Hey, everybody. This is David. Welcome to Common Purpose, to our workshop. You should be seeing four of us on your screen right now. Everybody want to say hi? Hi. Yeah. Thanks for joining us tonight for this workshop on um, two things that we're doing to kick off our remote and our advocacy work. Those are two pieces tonight, remote work and advocacy work. Um, and we want to do a quick little welcome to you here, um, Charles and I, just real quick, and then the four of us are going to do a quick little icebreaker, and then we're going to get going here, because we're, we're not going to take a ton of your time. Um, but I just want to start by saying that we knew coming into this year that 2020 was going to be uh, a heavy lift. It was going to be a significant um, endeavor. It was going to require all of our energy and our, um, our, tr our time, our treasure, and we're all in as an organization. And it, it, is everything, <laughs> it is everything that we expected it to be, but like also double, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's gotten even more complicated. And I'm 53 years old and I haven't been through a pandemic like this. Um, so we appreciate you coming with us through this and wanna just hit three things. And then Charles will say a few words. But we're, we have three things that make us us in Common Purpose. First, we're an action organization. We're committed to civic action always. That uh, we might talk about some things and strategize as we should, but eventually at the end of the day, we're going to act. So that's not going to change. That will never change for us as an organization. 
Second, we are an organization committed to community and, and the way we live out community is, is in teams and with one another. We always do things together. And that too is never gonna change because we can't sustain this work without that sense of connection and community. So the way we're setting up these new endeavors are for us to be doing them as essentially um, new, new kind of uh, 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 temporary teams. We're gonna, we have Daniel's leading these endeavors and Kylie's helping him on some pieces of it and I'm helping him on other pieces. But we're gonna be doing this in community and teams because that's how we do this work. And then third, we are always gonna be putting next generation leaders at the front of all of our work because it's not only enough to, to do the work and to do it in community, it's essential that we build the next body of folks who are gonna, who are, who are, are gonna take the baton, not only take it later, but run right with us, run us all together right now together. Um, so this is why tonight, Daniel and Kylie are gonna be leading some endeavors of this, and Daniel's been central to everything we're gonna share tonight. Uh, and we're never going to change on our next generation leaders. That's where most of our money and our, our energy goes, and it's going to continue to go that way. So thanks, everybody. Nothing's changing in terms of our core values or principles. But everything's changing in terms of the world and our ability to kind of like get through this as a civic organization and the work that we're going to do. So thanks for joining us tonight. I, I think the only thing I'd add to that is that we are, we're just getting started. So um, it, it's been what, three weeks since, since this whole thing kind of hit the fan. And uh, I think we we're starting to find our footing uh, thanks to some talented individuals that you see here in your screen. A lot of, uh, a lot of hours, a lot of hours spent building this out um, all day, all night, all weekend. Uh, kind of thing to to make sure that we we capture the moment um, that we we learn some new things that we figure out new ways to keep you all engaged and to like David st said stay to our principles uh, that's what's going on right now but this is just the beginning uh, we're just getting warmed up we're just figuring out how to stay us how to stay CP through this and we will evolve. Um, you know, David's saying we're not going anywhere and, and nothing's changing, but everything's changing. We are going to change with this, uh, but we're not leaving anybody behind. So stay tuned, stay with us. It's going to be exciting. You're going to learn some new things. You're going to do stuff you never thought that you would be able to do. Uh, and we're going to have some wins and we're going to do it together. Yeah, we're going to have some wins that we wouldn't have known we would have had if we hadn't done this. So. Charles and Daniel and Kylie are all going to do, we're all going to do quick kind of uh, uh, icebreaker introductions and we're going to share with you what is our kind of favorite, uh, our favorite, I'm looking over my shoulder because my wife is coming to, coming around the corner, um, looking over, uh, what is our favorite kind of thing we've come up with as part of quarantine. So Daniel, I'm wondering, have you like made any food or anything that's really cool? <laughs> Uh, hey everybody! Again, my name's uh, my name is Daniel Caseberg, um, and I am the um, uh, fieldwork manager for Common Purpose. Uh, today, I'm trying new recipes recently, and trying to be a little bit more creative with cooking. And so today, I made a vegan a vegan pesto, and I'm gonna I'm making some pesto pasta right after we get done today that I'm really looking forward to. Um, so that's that's my quarantine activity is is more time in the kitchen, man. Sweet. Thanks. Kylie? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kylie. Uh, I am learning Spanish. That is what I've decided to do. <laughs> That's cool. Because when I went to North Carolina and we were registering voters, we went to um, a part of Charlotte where I couldn't do a lot because of that language barrier. And I was like, okay, now more than ever, I'm going to learn Spanish. So now I finally have the time to, and I'm excited. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you. Um, I am I am learning. Um, I am relearning how to carry a baby in a lot of different ways while you're doing other stuff. So, like everyone knows, like you carry a baby a certain way. Um, I think she's crying right now. But uh, like, how do you do that? And like stir a pot at the same time or uh you know 
tech website, you know, it's just one hand on the baby and another hand, you know, doing what you need to do. It's an art form. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. So are you going with the football hold or what are you doing? Yeah, the football hold? Yes. The football hold, they're facing out. So you got to, like, support their head with, like, your, like, yeah. fingers kind of thing. It's very cool. They like it a lot. That's cool. Um, so I think my favorite thing is we have dis- – we, we, as a family, I, 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 my wife – who was just around the corner. And the reason she was over here coming down the stairs and she needed to get my attention is because she says, I'm watching you on the screen. And you, do you realize that every time you lean in really closely, your head is super big? <laughs> I said, oh, yes. I'm is Lisa like, watching this? Lisa, we've she, been trying to tell him this for months. <laughs> I think he enjoys it. He, he really likes it. I don't have good eyesight. So I have to like lean in to see certain things. But, but, uh, my wife and our two kids, one is 18, uh, two boys, one is 18 and one is 12. And we have set aside from four to five o'clock, you know, whenever we try to do this as family game time. All right. So we're, we're playing games together and, uh, you know, uh, we're having a lot of fun. And th- this is one of those things that like, you know, they, it's probably tough for the kids, but for the parents, it's glorious. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Tonight, folks, uh, as we are working remotely, and kudos, you don't see, I don't think he's not on the screen, but kudos to the guy who's running this show behind the screen, right? Wole Akimbo Soto, who has made it just possible all the way through Wole. All right. Hey, Wole, what's your favorite quarantine thing, man? <laughs> uh, I would say, hmm, watching movies. Finally having time to just sit and watch movies. <laughs> That's been my favorite pastime. That's cool. Hey, uh, you know, just working with all of you and our entire team is, is just tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so tonight we want to talk about two things, remote field work and a new advocacy program. And uh, this is the beginning of both of them. Daniel, take it away and remote stuff yeah um so let's go ahead and get started with uh just a couple weeks ago when we really started to realize that um COVID-19 was going to have a tremendous impact on our field work um and what we're doing you know it was really a tough but necessary decision um that David and Charles made to um, you know, make sure that everybody was safe and, and not taking off um, for the six trips that we had planned for the next several months. And so we wanted to uh, sort of use that as an opportunity to um, get reinvigorated, figure out how we can still continue to be involved and provide volunteers a great experience um, and really do some impactful work regardless of whether we're actually going out and traveling. So um, that breaks down into a couple of uh, new and emerging uh, concepts for us as an organization. One, uh, we're checking in with uh, all of our state leads and partner organizations in the six states that we're not able to go to to see what type of remote work they have. Two, we're creating um, new, new partnerships with national organizations to see what type of work they have that we can get involved with. And uh, I'm really excited that that Kylie is going to be leading that effort, and she'll explain that in just a little bit here. And then the third lane is um, this new sense of advocacy, and David's going to explain um, why we feel that it's important as an organization for us to advocate for uh, a mail-in ballot system nationally um, in the um, – in all of the chaos um, that is COVID-19, we wanted to make really decisive action and say, this is the stance that we're taking. This is what we're doing about it. And so that's what this third platform is. Um, and so we'll all work together to explain that. Um, David's going to talk about um, why we're choosing certain states to contact, uh, exactly what the effort is. And then I'm going to walk us through the process of it. Um, so those are the three things. And if you're a common purpose volunteer, whether you're just joining us or you've, you've been following us for a long time, you'll continue to stay updated on those three lanes. Um, work that is 
directly from the partner organizations that we weren't able to attend, uh, two, new and exciting uh, partnerships that we're working on, and then three is this advocacy lane. So, um, Kylie, would you would you be willing to hop in and tell us a little bit about um, our new relationship with Sister District and and sort of what that process looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Daniel. So um, as Daniel said, I'm going to talk about one of the new national partnerships that we have um, with Sister District. So just a little background on Sister D District. Um, like CP, they were founded after 2016. Um, and the Sister District project mission statement is to advocate the power, passion, and creativity of volunteers to win elections and turn states blue. Um, so most of their work is done targeting races in swing districts where flipping control of like the legislature in the state will help and um, partisan gerrymandering. So our work um, that I'm going to talk about is with the uh, upcoming primary in Pennsylvania. So um, we're really excited about this partnership and we'll have more opportunities with them in the future. So we're working on a letter writing campaign supporting the voter registration efforts in Pennsylvania. So it's not like for the primary per se. Um, the primary is on April 28th. And so we're mailing these letters exactly one week before they receive the citizens of Pennsylvania receive their registration forms. So they're being mailed on May 7th. Um, so to participate in this work, you have to have the following materials, um, a printer, printer paper, envelopes, stamps, and writing materials. Um, and then you also, again, have to write those and be willing to mail them on May 7th. So to participate, we have a Google form, um, which was sent out in like the last Friday's weekly update, um, but I'm sure that we can make that easily available um, again. And then once you sign up, you'll receive an email from the Common Purpose staff with an individual batch of 50 prospective voters and more instructions like a template and everything um and each batch of these letters like each 50 should take anywhere from an hour to two hours to complete so anyway like we were saying it's it's really unfortunate that we're unable to travel due to the circumstances but this is a really simple way to stay involved with um national field work from inside your house so thanks guys yeah, that's that's perfect. That really captures all of it. I'm just going to go ahead and um, do the present now for so that everybody can see where this uh, where to sign up and where it exists on our website. So I should be presenting now. So for everybody that's listening, if you if you go to our website at uh, commonpurposenow.org and then you go up here to the National Fieldwork tab. What you'll do is you scroll down here and we just have a quick little explanation on uh, our partnership, right? What that, what that looks like. And then just this really easy button for um, signing up. So all you need to do again is it has, it has all your materials, uh, some explanation, and then just a disclaimer that um, you're going to get an email from either myself or Kylie. We just need you to fill out this little form. It's four questions. And then that is it. Um, and so it's, it's really easy and really straightforward. And it exists, again, on the main part of our website, commonpurposenow.org, um, national field work. And um, we will get emails out to folks starting um, tomorrow. Let's, let me ask you a couple quick questions that might be on people's minds, OK? Um, 50 letters. I'm going to be handwriting from scratch 50 letters. Good question. No, uh, that is, uh, they're, they're partially written letters. So Sister District provides a template for us um, that is mostly partially written. The things that volunteers are filling in is um, uh, personal details and uh, a quick little like anecdote or something that's memorable to you or important to you about why you're a voter or why you choose to participate in democracy. Um, Sister District has been doing this type of stuff, like Kylie mentioned, since 2016, and all of their letter writing campaigns are specifically, um, they're like they're like little research projects, they're experiments each time, and so it's actually been proven to show that um, these partially written letters are what's, what's most effective as opposed to individual handwritten letters from folks, um, and that's just one 
way that we're tying in is that we're actually supporting this this ongoing research that Sister District is doing, um, and the timing matches up with an ongoing voter reg campaign that they're doing. All right. Hey, Kylie, do I have to pay for this stuff? Pay for – no, I mean, all you if need – yeah, go yeah, ahead. All you need is, is uh, the materials that we listed. So a lot of those things you probably have in your home. The only thing that you'd probably need to get is, is stamps. So I'm going to print out, a, I'm going to get them from you and I'm going to print them out and then I'm going to handwrite on them. Then I'm yeah. going to handwrite an envelope, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail. Is that yeah. right? Simple as that. Yeah, it's very easy. We'll send you everything you need. And we're totally going to be registering like people who are going to vote for Republicans, right? No. <laughs> we don't know, actually, right? I we don't we actually don't know. know. I guess that's true. Um, but, I mean, Sister District is it wants to turn states blue. So We are, we are specifically targeting um, voters, prospective voters, in what Sister District calls the rising American electorate, which is unmarried women, um, uh, people of color, and women of color. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to say a little bit about Sister District here. So Charles and I have had the good fortune to talk to their their National Civic Engagement Director, um, and she has told us a lot about how they've got formed and their, their efforts, and this is part of their 501c4 organization that does action. It's like the Sister District Action uh, organization, and as soon as we got connected to that portion of Sister District, we knew that we'd found our home with them. They do letter writing, they do specific postcard writing, they do phone calling. And Daniel, you immediately then got connected to the person in charge of this particular letter writing endeavor. And I mean, they, they have been on top of it, right? I mean, we have, we have the potential here to build out a really nice partnership here. It's really exciting. So this is, um, they just were within like two days, just gave me 10,000 addresses. Um, and so that's the, that's the first batch that we have, um, to 10,000. And then, uh, she said that as soon as we're done with that, that we just email her for whatever the next one is and that they want us doing these from now until November. Um, so that's really, really exciting. Stay tuned. It's going to be, um, in states all across the country. I think uh, I think the interesting thing about this journey is that uh, initially we thought we had to build a bunch of this stuff on our own, um, and and this is kind of the scrappy attitude that our leadership team has, which is like, okay, so if it doesn't exist right in front of us, we'll 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 build it, and then we go back to what our model is, and and CP doesn't do you know we don't go into states with with our own plans, we partner with local organizations, so to the extent that there's already an organization that's figured out how to do this, it's already figured out how to. Uh, yeah, that's a better background, David. That's good. Books. It okay. looks really collegiate, man. It looks like. We have more respect for you with that in the background. It's good. These are books. Very, These are very books. Yeah, it's kind of like, like a professor. It's good. Um, <laughs> so, I, so we go back to what our core, our core is. Our core is partnering with local organizations that are that with other organizations that know how to do this stuff already. So we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're not going to compete with them for for lists and for. For uh, for letters and stuff, we're we're gonna partner with them. We're gonna work through them, and we're gonna make them stronger. And they're gonna help us and teach us. So that's one of the cool things about this. Also, um, one of the one of our key contacts with Sister District is uh, from Seattle, and she's a, a Seahawks fan. So that kind of sealed the deal for us, right, David? Yeah, because she's not a 49ers fan, even though she lives in the Bay Area. So that was a slam dunk, definitely. Right. Once that happened, hundred um, percent. So. Let me just say one more thing about Sister District. Where's the name come from? Well, what they do is they pair together two state legislative districts, state legislative districts across the country, and they strategically select ones that are competitive in swing states, which is the kind of thing we do. Um, and they pair together uh, those ones in in competitive dist in competitive states with ones that are located in their their originating cities or their originating areas so they have they have a couple uh chapters in seattle and the seattle area uh, and we're in conversation with them about some potential specific connections there 
But what they do is they select all these key legislative districts, state legislative around the country, and they are almost all in the same states we are in because we're working the same terrain. So we're, these letters are going to Pennsylvania because we're in Pennsylvania. That's a competitive state. But they've also talked to us about North Carolina and Texas and Arizona and Colorado. Um, so the potential here is really high. And they they are doing an experiment here where they're trying out different methods. And when they get the results of that, they'll share them with us. We'll share them with you. So we're really trying to approach this in a data-driven way. Um, Daniel, you're the point person for this. Uh, Kylie, you're delivering all this stuff, right? But if they have questions, Daniel, do they reach out to you? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, and my email should be on that form, um, just so everybody knows. And uh, in case you don't, you're listening, it's uh, daniel at cpnow.org. Um, but uh, just let us know. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Okay, great. So next up, we want to talk about our advocacy program. Since we started in Common Purpose, we have had one issue. We focus on one issue, what we call voting justice, uh, specifically the right to vote, and then the, the, the chance to be encouraged to vote, that that's what our society should have. Everybody does have the right to vote. People should be able to actually exercise it and then be encouraged to exercise it. Right now in this country, because of coronavirus, uh, the, the ability to exercise the right to vote is in deep peril. Literally, people have to put their lives on the line to, to vote um, if they're going to come in physical contact with people in some states. So we, we have been looking beyond 2020, and we know that after 2020 is over, that there are a couple policies that we want to work on. We want to help to support if the Democrats gain control of the Congress and the presidency. We want to help pass HR1, which is a whole set of voting reforms that the House of Representatives passed right when the Democrats got control of the, the House. And it will be job one of the new Congress to pass. We want to support that. We want to push on that. We want to push legislators to pass that. And we also want to play a role in supporting legislators who are working for fair district drawing for congressional and state legislative districts around the country. We know we want to do that post 2020 and our plan was to dive into this kind of advocacy work then post 2020 and we would keep our eye on elections all the way through 2020. We would never walk away from elections after 2020, but we bring it together with this policy advocacy work. But we can't wait. We can't wait because the reality is that if we don't put into place a, ba a balloting system that can work in autumn of 2020, then the reality is that uh, we're, we're in a world of hurt as a democracy, and we're setting ourselves up for an absolute disaster and crisis um, that will not produce any kind of positive outcomes, no matter who wins, uh, or we won't even know what wins means. Um, so we have already states canceling or delaying, I should say, uh, their primaries. We've, I think we're up to almost 10 states now that have delayed their primaries, all right? Um, and all of them are saying they're delaying them because they can't put poll workers at risk. They can't ask people to go vote. Uh, that's dangerous because they can't practice social distancing in many of these places where you have to vote. Or you're handling a pen that somebody handed, handled just before you. All of these things. So we've got, what we've got to do is have a mail-in balloting system. That's what we've got to have. And there's a, there's a variety of ways to get there. And ultimately in this country, states make decisions about national, about voting, but they don't make those decisions in a vacuum. They, they take cues and signals from national leaders as well. And so Congress can be very influential on this. And so too can state governors and state election officials, because it is the mix of national leadership plus state leaders, governors and election officials that can make this happen. So we know this. And we're not the only ones by any means who know this. This is obvious that we've got to come up with a system for this year right now to make this happen. So we've created a new initiative that we're calling um, the kind of bail, the, the mail-in balloting surge or the mail-in balloting kind of push because this is right now, it's right here. We need to act on this immediately because the money has to, it has to occur. The decision has to be made. And then the money has to come to to make this happen, and the leaders need to get on board and make it make it so. 
Um, so I think it was on Thursday of last week that Charles and Daniel and Wole and I were talking about this and we decided we needed to make a push on this. We needed to do it right away. And so we set out over the last four days to put together a body of material so that we could put this into everybody's hands and make it doable for you. So Daniel's going to walk us through this work. But, you know, I just want to say that I'm really proud of what we've pulled together in four days here, that this is, this is our can-do attitude. And we're driven because we care about it. But we're also driven because we know you, the volunteers of Common Purpose, are, are hungry for this. You want, you want to do this. So we're delivering it because we know you're going you're gonna to take it and run, and we need you to. Um, so we're excited to go. Daniel, you got it. That sounds good, man. Um, it's, it, it's been really cool to see this come together in such a quick period of time. And, and um, I think it's really necessary because the political environment is going to change so much. And so um, we just we appreciate everybody just being so responsive with this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. But then, David, hopefully I can pull you in when we start talking about state selection. Um, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and present screen right now. Give me a second here. Okay. So for everybody that's with us and seeing this after the fact too. So if you go to our website, again, commonpurposenow.org, um, you'll see our main page and we want you to go up to, um, this tab here, advocacy in the top left corner. Okay. If I click advocacy, it takes us to the page where basically we're just, we're talking about our rationale for why we're doing this, why COVID is a tremendous threat to our elections and specifically outlining the states that we're going to take. First, um, we identify that our goal is to get officials to enact mail-in voting and we're going to contact um, four key officials in 27 strategic states that we have outlined. Um, and so I'm going to walk us through step by step what that looks like. But when we're here on this main advocacy initiative page, um, the first place that you'll want to go is clicking here for the full list of instructions. And this has um, basically just our master document of um, everything that you'll need. So your materials list, um, step by step instructions. Um, why we're using certain tools, and I'll explain those in a second, um, what types of documents you're working with, and then really important things to keep in mind because um, there's many of us in this community that have been making calls for years or are really proficient in writing emails to legislators, um, and there's others of us that maybe this is their first time, and so I just want to um, make sure that we're all on the same page and we can use this page instruction sheet as a resource list for um, just for things to keep in mind um, and maybe some challenges that you'll encounter as you embark on this process. So that's hey, the Daniel. yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. I was just going to jump in here cause I didn't want you to get off that screen. Um, but it, oh, that's, that's okay. Uh, I, I just want to tell everybody who's, who's watching this, that those instructions are that detailed because we want you to be able to walk right through it as if we're standing next to you, okay? And like I have put together a lot of IKEA things in my time and IKEA has no words to it, the directions. These, these instructions are extremely thorough and detailed so that you know exactly what to do. That, that's why that text is all there. It, that's what we put together. Yep, yep. And then it's also um, very intuitive on the website as well. Um, and, and big thanks to Wale and Charles for, for making that website so easy to access. And so this is in case you're, you're lost. I think that the best place to go is this first link here. Please read the full list of instructions here. That is the number one place to start, but then you'll see as we keep going that we're going to do a step-by-step -step what each of these things looks like. Okay. But just really briefly explaining to people why we've decided to choose these states. And I'm going to pull up this right here real quick. And maybe you can walk us through why um, we picked the states that we did. Um, because I know that that's something that's always really important for the, for the CP community. And it's a big element of uh, our typical Saturday introductory workshops. 
So hold on, before we do this, I'm going to jump in between these two um, political nerds here. Uh, <laughs> Uber nerds here. Um, Cause there may be some, there's probably some political nerds that are, that are watching this live stream right now. And then you saw this spreadsheet pop up and you realize that you're not the type of nerd that Daniel and David are. You're looking at this and I want you to, to let it wash over you, but not feel like you need to understand exactly every single thing that's in this. You don't need to be able to read all this. They're going to talk you through it and, and, and impress upon you how, in depth the research was for choosing states this is not a document that you're going to have to reference again this is not a part of the process you can forget about this and still do really well on knocking this out of the park um yeah go, david thank you John. Okay. yeah thanks daniel is that page up live can you sort right now as we're looking at it we might be able to yes so can you sort can you sort by column C? Sort by column C. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So there's really only a couple things to say about this this sheet, but the whole entire database that we built here, we put, built it in order to figure out what states we wanted to focus on in this national mail-in balloting surge. And so on the far left column, we don't need to scroll down, but our 50 states, all the states. The next state over is, is this a state that we're already focusing on? Is it, so have we already identified it as a key place? If so, it's an X in that box. Then the next two columns become the crucial ones. The third column is, is it says absentee. And it's a question, what, it, what we're categorizing in that column is how does the state currently handle mail-in ballots? All right. And there's four ways they might handle mail-in ballots. If you scroll down, please, Daniel, all the way to the bottom. At the bottom, you see Washington State because we're one of five states in the country that right now is a national, as a all-state mail-in, what's called universal mail-in balloting. All right, there are a series of other states above that, the next four, that are transitioning either to universal balloting or to one of the other categories. They're in, they're in transition. So you either have, first one you have is universal. Everybody does it. They, everybody automatically who has a residence and as a registered voter gets a ballot. The second is some kind of transitional space. And then we enter the two categories that really matter to us. They are absentee balloting and they are defined as either no excuse required or excuse required. Each of them is a type of absentee ballots where you would normally vote in person at a ballot at a polling location but instead you decide you can't or you don't want to. With the no excuse required states, you don't have to provide a reason for why you want a mail-in ballot. You just say, I want one, and they give it to you. That's, that's lovely, that's easy. The excuse required states make it very difficult to get mail-in ballots for you. Um, I, I've been through this when I went to Kentucky and we registered voters there. And one of the people that I, at the door knocked, where I knocked on doors wa needed to get an absentee ballot on the day of the election because of a health crisis that emerged right then. And I got on the phone with them and we talked to the, the officials for about 45 minutes. And it was unbelievably difficult uh, to, to do it. And so Kentucky is one of those states where excuse is required and it's really difficult. All we care about for this body of work, for this surge, are the two categories where an absentee ballot is doable either as excuse required or not excuse required and that's about 40 states where you can get an absentee ballot either excuse or not excuse once we did that we then did a little math calculation where we looked at the percent that actually did vote by mail the previous year um, and that's the next column over and you can see that you know alabama 3.18 percent of folks voted by mail the year before and if you scroll all the way down you see that people uh you know in the universal mail-in balloting they were extremely high um, and hawaii was only at 52 percent because they actually just shifted uh in february to universal mail by balloting so those those numbers you see there are 2018 numbers so they had about half of people in 2018 who voted that way what we ultimately did is we took all of the states that are, have absentee balloting where either you have an excuse or no excuse and we looked at what are the states that we're focused on, CP states, and also what are key states that have other strategic value to us. And we identified 27 states that are a point of focus. 
we then, it, Daniel and I went into those four columns there with the U.S. Senators, one U.S. Senators, two, the governors, the election officials, and we identified what parties hold those those four seats in each of those states. And so the far, the next to the far right, you see all these yeses. So if you could, yeah, if you sort by that column, L now, Daniel. Yep. Then we got we got all 27 our states that we came up with. We are happy to dive deeper into that, but we just want you to know that we have done the work to put you in a position where where we, as our volunteers, have maximal impact. Using that, then we get to another database that Daniel, I think you're going to pick up now and show um, the other the other kind of process. But we we've identified the states and the people that need to be talked to. Yep, that's right. Um, and so that that's just that's just a frame of reference for why we're choosing these states. And so when, when you're making these calls or writing these emails, um, just know that that's the type of effort and um, research that went into making those choices. If we're, let's assume that I'm, let's, let's go ahead and get started and let's assume that I am a um, prospective uh, volunteer. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get signed up for this. So what I'm going to do is, I'm hoping everybody can see. Okay, we're going to, I'm just going to go ahead and get signed up, putting my email address and my name. You can commit to any number of states, right? You can do a handful, you can do more than that, or you could decide that you are like, I have so much time on my hands with all this social distancing and working from home, and uh, I want to go ahead and do all 27 states. So I'm just going to put that one right there. Hold and, out. Even if I don't have a lot of time, I'm super committed to this, and I really want to make a difference. Yes, that's that's fantastic. That's also a all 27 states, um, and we encourage you to do that. Um, we can also then pick what type of contact we're trying to do. We have options to do phone calling, emailing, tweeting, or um, I'm going to choose all of the above just because why not? Um, and then this thing is, do you commit to daily filling out the provided contact log form? So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but it is really important. One of the most important things of this entire endeavor is that we're able to track what we're doing as a community um, so that we know how to measure our impact. Um, as a group. And so we really are going to, we're asking and we're really relying on um, our community and you as volunteers to help us with that. It's really going to help the organization tremendously if you go in to fill out the contact log form. And so I'm going to go ahead and mark yes and then submit. Okay. So one thing, uh, so we're doing this live on the fly. This is really good. So uh, Daniel, I want you to make a change on that in the survey, mm -hmm. in the form. Can you make it so that people can choose um, like a few of those? But yeah, right? gotcha. Cool. Gotcha. I will do that. Um, yeah, so those are going to be check boxes and not a drop down, okay, just so everybody knows. And then you do you do have to mark mark the yes on this, okay? When you hit so when you hit submit, I just submitted it, so don't have to worry about it. But when you hit submit, then you're good. We've registered that you've um, decided to do this. Right. And so we'll we'll be there to um, not not keep tabs on you, but just know that you're doing it and then also um, be online to support you. So that's great. I've completed step one. Now, step two is I want to go ahead and start thinking about actually doing this. And I've cleared my schedule and I am sitting down to contact everybody, all of these elected officials in these states. So then I'm going to pull up the advocacy mail in ballot contact information, which is a PDF. So whatever you want to do, whether you want to have this open in your browser, whether it's more helpful for you to print it off and check as you go, you know, whatever it works best for you, we encourage you to get um, set up in your flow. But it's really easy right now if it's in your web browser to just, um, like if we want to send an email, all I have to do then is click through and I get right into um, Senator Richard Shelby's uh, email contact form okay so this is all of the contact information for all of these four representatives by each of the states that we've decided to pick um so daniel and, yes sir. Just, just slow just i want you to pause for a second just yeah. so the far left column are the states right yep. 
let's just walk people through. It's like a little puzzle, okay? Um, four left columns of the states, and these are the four people we want you to contact, right? Yeah, U.S. senators, um, both U.S. senators, because the bill that we're advocating for is a Senate bill. Uh, the governor in that state, who plays a large responsibility in working with state elections officials, and then the fourth contact is the uh, chief or head election official in each state. That's going to vary by the state. Um, for the most part, it's going to be the secretary of state. But as you can see, it's um, some states, it's the lieutenant governor. Um, and in other states, there's, a, there's an election official that's been appointed, like we have an administrator of elections. And so um, that's the fourth type of contact uh, for if we go into the second column here, the Washington, D.C. office numbers are just going to exist for the United States senators. Um, and then there's also local office phones. So it's important to call, be calling both the D.C. and the local office when we're doing this. Uh, when we go over to email portal, portal that is the fourth column here. Um, something to keep in mind is that for most of these, uh, the lawmaker will have you send an email through an online portal like this. So it's a contact form, you're filling out your information, and then you get into your message here and it sends, right? And it's all done online. However, there are some, there are some lawmakers that have actually published just their email address. Like, um, like here, if we go to John Merrill, the Secretary of State of Alabama, what you would want to do then is you would just want to click John Merrill, SOS, Alabama.gov, and um, go from there. And so we've, we've made that pretty clear, whether it's a portal, whether it's a Facebook message, or whether it's an actual email address that we want you to send to. So when you're doing this, it's also very important to have your email address open, um, and, or to have your email inbox open as you're doing this too. And then the last column is a Twitter handle, and that has everybody's um, Twitter username right there for you as well. And by each of the states in alphabetical order. Wow, that looks really good. That's really impressive. I'm excited. I'm going to do Massachusetts, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, and Maine. Those are my five. That's amazing. Um, yay. <laughs> Couldn't be easier, too. Great job, guys. So, Hey Daniel, what yeah. am I gonna say? What am I gonna say when I do this? Awesome! That is step three, man. <laughs> I love that you're ahead of the game. So, um, whether you've done this before or this is gonna be your first time doing anything with advocacy, we've decided that we want to help you out with a couple of scripts and templates, okay, for doing this type of thing. So let's go ahead and start with emails. Um, so thing is, we want to keep it real brief and real easy. So um, this should be about three lines. Yes, it is about about uh, three or four sentences each time. Okay, so when you're writing emails, you can use this document. Um, and it, again, it's helpful to have it open on your computer, or if you, you're you're uh, if you'd prefer to print it, then go ahead and do that as well. But you can just do as it's as easy as copying and pasting these messages to the senators, the governors, and the state elections officials. And it's each of them has different messaging. So it is really important that we are um, sending these individualized messages rather than just a one, uh, a catch-all, right? For all of the officials, each one of them has a different thing that we're doing. For phone calls, um, it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more smooth, right? It's a little less formal. And, and again, especially on the phone calls, I encourage people to just be comfortable speaking in your own voice and talking how you normally talk. This is uh, just a, an example of a place to get you started. If you've never had the experience of doing this, um, you know what's right for you and you know what you're comfortable with. And so um, use this if you feel like you need to, but then also go ahead and if you, if you want to type your own thing or, um, uh, be uh, saying, asking something specifically. However, the one thing that is really important is that we are specifically, especially for the senators, we are specifically advocating 
for one bill. And it's really important that we we don't um, when we're when we're speaking to the Senate offices that we need to mention this bill. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit. But it is the Resilient Elections During Quarantine and Natural Disasters Act of 2020. Um, when you're on the phone with a representative from a Senate office, it's very important that you say, I want this senator to support this bill. Um, you don't have to do that for the other ones, and we make that clear in this script here. But that is the way to get started. So that is step three. Hey, Daniel, I want to jump in for, for a second. Yeah, man. Um, so, folks, um, two things. One is... If you get nothing else out of your mouth when you call or your email or your tweet, you just say, we want mail-in balloting and we need it now for our democracy. That's all you got to really say. Okay, you, Daniel's absolutely right at the Senate level. Tell them exactly the bill. But for the governors, for the election officials, even for the senators, the most important thing is we want them to know that there is a public out here that wants these things. And it is amazing how responsive they are when they start to get phone calls and emails and um, uh, uh, tweets. So, Daniel, just I want to do a check with you on this. You've worked on a campaign, and these these folks are not going to have long time mail in balloting. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Yep. All right. So we'll be we'll be. Uh, you know, I I used to be one of those folks in the Senate office answering the phone, um, and. What they're going to do is they're going to make a note of that um, in like a big master spreadsheet. And what that does is it actually shows um, and shows all of the priorities and the issues that folks are talking about. And it keeps things top of mind um, for that senator or, or for that elected official. And um, in something that is so fast moving in this political environment and an issue that it really hasn't gotten as much um, national attention as we think that it deserves. Now is the time to really start bringing that top of mind. Um, and for, for one thing for us as volunteers to keep in mind, it's easy to think that, um, it's easy to think that we're not having impact, right? You know, it's like I, 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 made, I made a call and uh, somebody was short with me on the other line or I made an email or I did an email and um, I'm probably not gonna hear I'm not gonna get a response from that at all, okay, right? That's easy to think that way, but then think about if we have an entire community of hundreds if not thousands of people in the CP community that are doing this, um, that are taking this action daily over a large stretch of time and we're multiplying that by hundreds of people, it will absolutely make a difference. So that's one thing to really keep in mind as we keep going, um, don't be discouraged. Yeah, can we do? Can we actually do a quick check on that, Wale? Um, can you tell us how many people have been uh, watching this thing so far? Yeah, we've had about uh, thirty-five to forty people. Um, okay, thirty-five to forty people just watching this live. More people are going to see this after the fact. We we're going to have hundreds of people just from CP taking this action with you. That is real impact. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I just really quickly just want to say we got a, we got a question. Um, we got a question from Paul. Paul, thank you so much for all of your support and for, for tuning in and for the question. Um, the question is what actions are we asking these officials to take um, at the Senate level? We're asking them to support the resilient elections during quarantine and natural disasters act. But at the state level, we are insisting that governors and state elections officials um, work with their cabinets and their state legislators to um, get mail-in ballots now. Yeah, and if everybody out there thinks like Mitch McConnell's never going to do anything on this. This is why would we waste our time at the Senate? Because senators are influential in their states as well, and the states are really where the action is around elections. It's where the big action is. So right now, I see more possibility for Republicans to actually act on this than I've ever seen on a pro-democracy initiative. We have de Republican leadership in Ohio, in Florida, in places where they are gonna want these kind of initiative, these kind of mail-in balloting. So we're gonna push on Democrats and Republicans as well as there's a few nonpartisan election officials as well. So we, we I'm confident that, that Here's what I know for sure. I don't know for sure if our actions 
we'll ever achieve what we want. But I know for sure if we don't do these things, then we're not going to be possibly achieving the things that we want. All right. So let's, this is, this is a step towards getting it done right now. That's right. We got to do it now. Yep. That's right. And so hopefully um, the, the scripts and the templates are, are making sense for folks and um, just know that we don't need, you don't need to um, use these scripts and we're not going to restrict you. They're just a place to get started and a catch all for all types of volunteers. So we're gonna move on quickly to the last step, which is step four, and that is our contact log form. This is super important, okay? So I'm gonna use that same email address again. I'm gonna select, because I'm assuming that I've contacted all 27 of these, actually that I didn't get to all 27 today, but I got to these senators in Alabama, great. I did all this. I got to Governor Kay Ivey in Alabama, and I got to Secretary of State John Merrill in Alabama. I wasn't able to do anybody else, right? But I got these four people in Alabama. All I do then is just checking the box to, to, to let Common Purpose know that I did this. I'm scrolling all the way at the end. Bear with me. All the way at the end, there's a submit. Okay, great. Your response has been recorded. So now Daniel and David and Charles and Wale and Kylie at Common Purpose know that I made all of those contacts with the reps from Alabama today on, uh, on March 24th. And when I go back tomorrow, all that I have to do then is do the exact same thing and just change the date and just show whatever new contacts I made, okay? Um, this is really important for us to measure how we're doing, um, what type of reach we're having, and just at the total engagement level for uh, our community. The last thing that I wanna point out here is, um, let's go over the bill really quick, just in case there are any questions. You can read the full bill here if that's helpful for you, but I, I, I think the best place to start would be an explanation of the bill which has been introduced by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Um, so really quickly, just the, 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 brief, um, the brief nuts and bolts of the resilient elections during quarantines and natural disasters act of 2020. Essentially what this is going to do is that in the event that 25 states declare an emergency related to COVID and other um, infectious disease or natural disaster, what it would do is it would release money to offer all registered voters the ability to vote by absentee ballot, offer voters the ability to submit electronically a request for an absentee ballot rather than having to do so in person, offer voters the choice of receiving their blank absentee electronically and returned by postal mail, accept absentee ballot requests up until five days before the election, um, and then accept ballots that have been postmarked by election day. So what this would do actually is this would provide $500 million in grants to states to cover the cost of postage and then the high-speed scanners that would be necessary for this. And so it's just a release of federal money to states requiring them to get their state election systems on board for a potential um, need to do this for the November election. This can be done through a Senate bill and a Congress, not Congress and president signing it. It can also be a step taken by a governor in a state or an election official in a state. So all of these are different levers to pull and we're going to push at the Senate because that's the toughest blockade at the Congress level because the House will support this. The House and the Democrats will support this. So the Senate is the toughest blockade at the federal level and then the key people at the state levels are the governors and the state election officials. That's why we've picked those four folks for, every, for our key states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that basically is wrapping it up. It's pretty simple in terms of there's just the four steps. Everything is here on our website, and then you can always reach one of us if you have questions, um, and I'm available 24-7 um, to be able to answer those types of questions, right? Um, it's pretty straightforward, but 
Um, let's go ahead, maybe before guys, before we wrap up, do you think it would be good um, to do some Q and A in case we have some? I, David, we have we have one. Can I go ahead and read it off to you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but if everybody, how could somebody send in a question? How are they doing that right now? I defer to Charles on that one. So uh, this is standard. So folks who are are used to doing our live stream, they know they can comment on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, right now, Wally's running that by himself, so he's probably running back and forth checking both of them. And then there's a phone number that's actually on the, the live stream screen that people can text in questions to. Yeah. Uh, I'll, read, I'll go ahead and read um, a f the first one from, from Daniel Bloom. Um, can they make it happen in time for November? I think, I think that's Paul Bloom again. But uh, Okay. <laughs> you wrote, you wrote, Wale wrote the message to you. Okay. Okay. From Paul, can they make it happen in time from November? Yes, they can, and they need to move fast. So that's why we're moving now. We could have we we thought about can we just wait a week or two to pull this together? We don't have time. We need to do this now. The attention of the nation is focused on the coronavirus. Let's get this done right now. By the way, this is a long-term voting justice endeavor. To make it easier for people to vote is part of our core. It is a core to who we are. So this is a crisis moment when we can make this happen, not only for now, but as a long-term move. Because once people start to vote by mail, they don't like to go back. They don't want to change. They want that, they want that ease of access. So yes, they can do it by fall. By fall, we're going to add a couple more resources to that page, uh, to the page that Daniel's been showing us, the National Fieldwork page. I'm sorry, the advocacy page. There's a couple other pieces that are some white papers that have been written about how it can be done and why why it needs to move fast. That's right. Um, we've got another question coming in. That is, oh, Paul says thanks. Totally agree. Nice. Um, we got a question from uh, Gary Kimura, who says, what is the current level of support for this bill in the Senate? Uh, you know, the, the uh, right now, if there was a vote on this, I think it would pass. And I think it would pass by about with about 70 votes. Uh, the issue is, would Mitch McConnell put it up for a vote? All right. You'd have 47 Democrats that would support it. And then you have a, a number of Republicans that would support it because the, the reality is the Republicans want um, their constituencies to be able to vote too. Like Florida has a massive population that they would benefit from mail-in balloting. So I think there's a really good chance it's going to get up, get brought up and pushed through the Congress. However, because Mitch McConnell is uniquely terrible, the reality is that even if it doesn't happen at the Congress level, our push for it on Congress and with the governors and at the state, the state elections officials means that we can get this done in key states like Ohio, like Florida, like uh, other places like Texas, as well as a whole bunch of Democratic states. Yeah. And, and just to piggyback off of that, it also has um, a, a House companion. We're not choosing to focus on the House because that the House would pass something like this. But just so everybody knows, there is a House companion and um, one of the first three co-sponsors on that is actually um, Susan Del Bene from Washington's First. Um, and so that's something that already has traction in the House. And if that is something that continues um, to, to have success and then is passed in the House, it would be really apparent and it would be a lot of pressure on the Senate to do something um, as well. Okay, we have one more question from Susan Poston. Are state officials interested in hearing from out-of-state individuals? Good question. That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, one thing that has been really interesting in, in doing all this research and, and looking at these pages is that actually many uh, officials have comments like on their web page for like, tell us your opinion on a piece of legislation. And there's even numbers for out of state and in state callers. And so especially with bigger offices like Senate offices and 
um, probably particularly governors too, um, they're used to getting calls from out-of-state individuals, um, and most email portals are situated so that you can email from whatever location, right? You don't have to be a constituent, um, but there are going to be other elected officials that are not going to accept that, right? That you're when you submit your your address, it's going it's going to deny you from sending that message. There there might be a few of those, and that's okay as well. Um, this is really the primary tool that we have right now to be able to lobby and um, to get this uh, message out to those elected officials. And so um, whether they're interested or not, we have the ability for most people. David, do you want to hop in? Oh, my God, I really do. I really, really do okay. on this one. So um, I'm a parent. I got two kids. And 80% of the time, our kids... Uh, get things that they want because they just wear us down, all right, as parents. And this is the way that politics works at the national and the highest levels, is you make the pain so great for people that if they don't do what you want, the pain keeps coming. So we, we're we not in this to be super nice at this moment. We're fighting for the soul of our democracy here, all right, for the heart and soul of it. So we want to call, and when somebody gets short with us, that's actually a win. That's a win for us because they're because they're getting pissed. They're getting annoyed, right? So, I, I it's one of my favorite things to do is to call, tweet, and email from out of state to people. And I know that about a third of my stuff is not going to get through, but the rest of stuff's going to get through. And then the next day, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do it all over again. And eventually, the aides start getting annoyed, and then the aides start passing that on to the the, the legislators and so on. So. Let's not worry about whether they're going to actually uh, all of our messages are going to get through. We're just going to we're going to throw the kitchen sink and we're going to go. We're going to go as hard as we can. Hey, one more one more addition to that form, the daily reporting form, Daniel. Let's just put like a big comment box at the very bottom right before you submit and let people submit whatever like unique experiences they had, conversations they had. You know, so and so, I called their office and they're feeling really stressed out about this. I think we're getting to them, you know, or so and so said, Hey, I flipped on this. Yeah. Um, we're not telling anybody yet, but, you know, we're, we're letting people know here and there, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, go to, I think one day you'll call, like you'll call on Tuesday and you'll get like, you'll get one staffer that's been there for like three years. And then you call on Friday and you get like the intern that's like, like, of course, I'm going to pass this on, like, and right. so it's going to depend on the, the staff person there, too. But these types of things, like I said, it's all going to be passed up a chain. And um, the more mentions this has, the better. But really, it's we don't have an option to not do this. It has to happen. So if you are in the group in the common purpose that is like nice and doesn't want to bother anybody this is your moment to be that annoying person that just like take on the role for a little bit and just take it on for the good of our democracy five people a day five calls a day five emails a day five five uh tweets a day whatever it's it's great and you are going to get some responses from people that are going to be like so so glad you called they're gonna be like hey we are we're getting the calls it's running 10 to 1 right now thanks for calling all right and this is precedes my time with Common Purpose, but the reality is that I was very active in the push to, to block the Republicans or to concur to persuade them to, to not pass the the complete devastation of, of Obamacare. All right. And one of the reasons that Susan Collins and John McCain and Lisa Murkowski voted against getting rid of Obamacare is because the outrage and the anger and the energy among Democrats in contacting their offices ran so high. So this is it. Plus, we encourage our own folks when we call them too. They're like, we want them to know we're in it with them. I think that that is all of the questions that we have. Um, so I think just to make sure that we're respectful of everybody's time, Charles, do you want to wrap us up on this and say where it's going from here?
You're on mute, man. Hey, Charles, you're on mute. There he is. Hey, yeah, I do. I, I got somebody here who's a little fussy right now. So, oh, uh, I see. David, do you want to you wanna wrap it up? Sure, I will. Just a second. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a tweet right now. Are you doing the thing right now? I am. I'm going to so fired up you decided to jump in already, huh? I did. I have to tell you. I'm like, <laughs> I did. So how am I going to oh, yeah, present now? And you're going to see who I'm writing it to, okay? Because <laughs> no, it's not. Cause I, Mitch, is, Mitch is like, if there's anybody that I'm willing to – no, never mind. All right? So, <laughs> <laughs> no, so let's see. I hear how do I do is I share, sure. right? I right, love it. Present now. So here it comes. Remember, we can see your whole thing here, man. So don't don't uh, worry. Don't worry about it. So I hate Senator Collins. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Way to go. Yep. You can but say notice it's that I'm not. I'm not for a moment using your script. Yep, you can say it's, it's the moderate thing to do. Oh, that's good. Yeah. All the moderates are doing it. Yeah. Oh, that's even better. I'll say that. There we go. Okay. Good tweet. Good tweet. Good tweet, David. All right, so I'm going to get off the sharing. Um, <laughs> So, Kylie, I'm going to ask you to say something to close this up here because part of our job in this organization is, is to have leadership, leadership folks step up. So, Kylie, uh, just can you share the fact that you you made a decision about this summer, mm -hmm. all right? You made a decision about where you want to spend your time and your energy and your – can you just share it with one minute to close this up, please, because I want everybody to hear this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I had a few opportunities lined up for this summer, but after I went on the civic tour trip to South Carolina, I thought a lot about 2020 and how I want to spend my time. Um, so I've decided to stay in Seattle and continue working with Common Purpose um, through the fall even, taking autumn off because I think this really is the year to do it and I'm all in. Yeah, awesome. Hey, well, this is where we do go. This is where we do go teams, right? So, everybody, put your hand in, in the middle. All right, yeah. hand in. Yep. Well, hey, you. Let's go. Well, hey, man, thank you for running the show. All right. Okay, so down on common, up on purpose, everybody. One, right. two, three. Common purpose. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, y'all.